it's, it's, I love to write. And I'm doing different kinds of things right now, for example. I mean, I tend to, you know, I've, the, um, I mean, many of my colleagues you know, have many books I don't. So that's the, and I've managed to survive in the academy uh, without that, but by the skin of my teeth at times. And it's, it's, but, um, but articles are easier, but articles I still, I wrestle with. I often end up writing them um, because of an immense demand. Usually a friend invites me to write something, mm. or a specific journal, or mm -hmm. a book. Um, and I tend to work well under the demands of friendship. So I tend to write something, you know, and the, you know, the complicated demands of the friend yelling at you, you, jerk, you promised this. So then I stay up for three or four nights, and I, the logic of brinksmanship, and, and I finish the darn thing. Um, and it's usually pretty, forgive my language, shitty, because it's, I wrote it for the duress under three or four nights, and then, but usually there's some smart ideas in it, and then hopefully I have a thoughtful editor, and I have my own thoughtfulness, and I can rewrite it. You know, so once I have a first draft of something, it's easy for me to totally disembowel it and recreate it. Mm -hmm. The challenge for me is just getting to a first draft mm -hmm. that more or less has a form. And once I have that, I can relax and I can say, you know, and I just take a week off, don't look at it, mm -hmm. and then I think, oh yeah, this is terrible. What was I thinking? But I have this form, um, and I write in two kinds of ways. I tend to write articles which are more or less what most people write, and I tend to write articles I call Lorenzian. You know, after me, Lawrence, because there people people say, oh, that's very Lawrence. Yeah. But so I have this recent piece called the Gay Guru, mm. and it's for a volume on the Guru on new forms of Guru-based religious and, and not so religious movements in in India in particular. Mm -hmm. And the editor wanted me to write about a very interesting TV yoga guru, very very popular in India, named Baba Ramdev, uh, who has been very critical of the recent Delhi High Court decision to, in effect, decriminalize homosexuality. Uh, and he wanted me to think about why this particular backlash was being, you know, publicly produced through everyone's favorite TV yoga guru. And, but what I had to say wasn't that interesting. It was sort of a general sociology of backlash and, and um, threatening the horses. And, you know, it was, I think it was correct, but I, I hadn't done field work with, with him or with people watching his TV show. And I didn't feel I had that much to say. But it was a provocation to think about other kinds of questions, and more generally about complicated ways in which sexuality and what a guru offers, which is both teaching and healing, at certain moments in my research and the lives of people I know have become intertwined. And so I used that as a jumping off point. Mm -hmm. And in part, it was an essay I wrote for my students and for my teachers. Mm -hmm. And its question was, why do we fail? when we fail as teachers, um, mm. and how do we, as students or as teachers, deal with that failure? And I had to define what I meant by failure in this case, and what I think I meant was when we uh, are too committed to the anxieties we bring as intellectuals to a project to teach effectively, because we want our students to solve the problems that we cannot solve, mm. or to do the thing that we cannot do. Mm -hmm. And that's both where teaching is at its most effective, when we have something that needs to be transmitted, a problem, a struggle, mm -hmm. but it's also where it can, it can break or it can fail. And so and my question was, how do we both as students and as teachers deal with the kind of failure of pedagogy? Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to suggest that in part the ethics of the guru, in a variety of specific contexts, not, you know, uh, were efforts to think around the question of failure. And I wanted to suggest that queer theory thinking around questions of time mm -hmm. and pedagogy and the ways in which queer life is often not in correct sequence. I'm not having kids in the sequence mm -hmm. in certain mm -hmm. historical moments. I'm, I'm uh, producing a different way of thinking about time. It doesn't have to be uh, queer life, but it's one way to think about that. Uh, might offer a way into thinking about failure and, and ethics of failure. So now that was a complicated piece because I'm addressing a lot of different things, and I had to find a way to bring it together mm -hmm. for a reader. Mm -hmm. And in part, I did so through uh, a conversation I was having with a friend that begins and ends the piece, and I come back to. So it produces a lattice, a structure. Mm -hmm. My piece is not Aristotelian in the unities, that mm -hmm. is, it is not a single argument with a close set of data, but it does work through a literary structure. Mm -hmm. It has an opening vignette, 
vignette is, of course, a tricky piece for anthropology. It's part of its seductions. Mm -hmm. It's part of its way of naturalizing place and time, mm -hmm. which is often troubling. Mm -hmm. But it can also be a tool to allow uh, for breaking open the world and rethinking it if I, as I try to use it, which is where I open up something, I come back to it, but then I tie into it something else. And I think actually as I was writing my disc, I didn't think about this now, one of my models might have been this wonderful classic um, Kashmiri Sanskrit text from a uh, medieval text called the Katasarit Sagar, or the uh, Ocean of Streams of Story. Mm -hmm. um, Salman Rushdie, for example, in his book Harun in the Sea of Stories, plays with um, this text. Mm -hmm. And in many, it's like many classic folkloric compendium, which like take the Arabian Nights, mm -hmm. where there's this main text, Shahrazad's telling stories to the prince to stay alive. And then the stories themselves have the stories within stories within stories. But we always move outwards back to Shahrazad. Mm -hmm. keeping herself alive through story and back into story after story mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how I tend to work and that's also I think about what I do I mean Kierkegaard at one point Kierkegaard the philosopher said many mm -hmm. not so nice and sometimes misogynist things about women through Scheherazade mm -hmm. also occasionally said some thoughtful things and one of the things he said um, uh, was that we like Scheherazade right to stay alive. we tell stories to stay alive Mm -hmm. And and I think that's why I do what I do. I, I, I don't think I could survive if I didn't try to work through stories. I have a friend, or one of those complicated friends like Job's friends, who once tried to be helpful when I was writing my book, um, and had a, having a different understanding of the relation of story to thinking, once said to me in a way that felt a bit patronizing, well, you tell good stories. But for me, stories aren't just stories. They're the grounds for thinking and politics. And, and not just, because stories can do that, not just for shutting down thinking, for reifying things, but for opening them up. And I suppose the challenge of my writing is because stories do both, and, and storytelling does both. Uh, and I struggle to find a form of storytelling that allows me to do theory to bridge complexities in the world, mm -hmm. to think about emergences, to think about persistences, mm -hmm. um, um, to contend with paradox, but to also say simple things that need to be said. Mm 